Hello, everyone. I'm sorry that I have to be gone today, but the show goes on. Uh, we today are going to be working on the last section of Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is an overview of functions and all the properties with functions. And yesterday, we completed Section 2.6. And so I'm going to read off the answers for that. So if we need to, let's start by having our homework out. If we need to pause the video until everyone has their homework out, go ahead and do so. Otherwise, I'm going to assume that we are good to go. Question 31, when you add the two functions, you get 3x plus 2. When you subtract the two functions, you get x plus 4. When you multiply the two functions using multiple distribution or foiling, most likely in this case, you'd get 2x squared plus x minus 3. When you divide the two functions, it would be simply written as 2x plus 3 over x minus 1. You cannot cancel out these x's. They are part of a larger expression. 33, when you add the two functions, you get 3x squared plus x minus 5. When you subtract the two functions, you get negative 3x squared plus x minus 5. When you multiply the two functions, you end up with 3x cubed minus 15x squared. When you divide the two functions, you get x minus 5 over 3x squared. 51a is 2x plus 14. 51c is 18. 55b is 80x squared minus 120x plus 43. 55d is 123. 61a is the square root of x minus 1, 61c is 1, 91 is 1, and 93 is negative 6. There are the answers for section 2.6. I will check this homework when I return the next day, but you already have the answers for it. So if you have any questions, circle any problems that you have questions for, and then have them ready for me when I return. Otherwise, we need our note packet out to 2.7. Uh, it's the first day of it. We're taking two days to do it. It's a bigger section. So your notes will say 2.7 day one. As you're getting your note packet out, I'm going to do just a little lead-in discussion because today's topic is on inverses. And so we're going to talk about first, what does an inverse mean in English? Could you use it in a sentence? Here's an example. You might say that an inverse is something that is the opposite or reverse of something else. His approach is the inverse of most research, would be an example sentence. What does the word inverse mean in math? Can you give an example? In mathematics, it's very similar. It's operations that undo one another, that return you to the beginning. So addition and subtraction are inverse operations. If I start at a number and add 3, the inverse of adding 3 would be subtracting 3 because I get back to the same number. Example, if I start at the number 12 and I add 3, I'm, I'm at 15. If I then subtract 3, I'm back to 12, I'm back to where I started. So they undo one another. That's a very important property that we'll see with the last part of today's lesson, that it gets you back to what you supplied. To start, we're going to deal with a... Uh, kind of a real-life context situation that makes it a little easier to grasp these concepts. So here's the lead-in. It says, biologists have found that the number of cricket chirps per minute is actually a function of the outside temperature. The function is given below. So how does this function work? Well, I supply some temperature, and it's going to return for me the number of cricket chirps. So can I use this function to calculate the following and then interpret them? So we're kind of doing... A uh, review of how function notation works because it's very much connected to how we're going to study inverses here in a moment. So to start, if I supply 75, we know I just need to put 75 in for t and then simplify. I end up with 4 times 35 and 4 times 35 should be 140. So I know that C of 175 is 140. Then it asked me to interpret it. Well, what is this? Uh, 75 mean? This 75 means temperature. This 140 is the number of cricket chirps that it returns. So I would say at 75 degrees, chirp rate is 140 chirps per minute. That's what the interpretation would mean. One more. What if I do C of 40? C of 40 would then be 4 times 40 minus 40. That leads me at 4 times 0, which is 0. This is kind of where the model breaks down to the very last point in which the model applies. It's essentially saying that when the temperature is 40, the chirp rate is 0. It starts to get too cold for crickets to be out and operating. At 40 degrees, chirp rate is zero chirps per minute. 
And that's how the regular function notation will work. And that's kind of all well and good. I can give it a temperature. It will tell me a chirp rate. It would be slightly more interesting, though, if I could be outside and just count the number of chirps and then use that to determine an estimate for the temperature. Well, the problem with the way the original formula was set up was I supplied a temperature would give me a chirp rate. I want the opposite. So I need to resolve this equation so that I have T equals, so that I supply a chirp rate, and then it's going to return for me a uh, temperature estimate. So in order to do this, uh, what I can do is, well, I'm going to solve. So if I solve for t, there's a couple things. Some people might divide both sides by 4. Some people might distribute. It doesn't really matter. I'll distribute just to show it really doesn't matter. I get 4t then minus 160. I then add the 160 over the other side. And the last step is I'm going to divide everything by 4. Divide by 4, divide by 4, divide by 4. My new equation is going to be then c divided by 4 plus 40 equals t. I'm going to rewrite this so t is on the other side. t is equal to c divided by 4 plus 40. Now I can give it a chirp rate. It's going to return for me a temperature. We actually call this now the inverse function. This new equation is called the inverse function because it takes the original output as the new input. What do I mean by this? Well, if I looked at the original equation, I supply a t, it returns a chirp rate. With the inverse, I supply a c now, and it's going to return a temperature. And that's the exact opposite of what we had before. You will see, though, if the book were to write this answer, this is how they write uh, the answer for the inverse. They would write it in the following way using function notation. They put c, and they use a negative 1 to mean inverse when we study exponents uh, down the road. We'll review why that a negative 1 as an exponent means inverse. If you know a little bit about exponents, you might check for yourself what like 5 times 5 to the negative 1 gives you, and you might start to see why it means inverse. It's because it gets you back to the beginning of multiplication, which is 1, because 5 to the negative 1 turns out to be 1 fifth. So if I were to write it in function notation, I'd say c and the negative 1 means inverse. I would say c is inverse, and then in parentheses, we use the variable x to mean input. When I supply an input, it's equal to the input divided by 4 plus 40. We know for the inverse function, though, that this x really is a chirp rate because it has to be the original output. So that's how we would write it in function notation. All that happens from here to here is a renaming. I just rename it using the variable x because x stands for inputs in mathematics. And that's what an inverse is. So inverses, the definition is functions f of t and f inverse of t, we use the negative 1 exponents mean inverse, are inverses if the input of f is the output of f inverse. And if the output of f is the input of f inverse, it just means that they're flipped. So for example, here's a mathematical way to write the property. If for the original, when I give it A, it returns B, then it means for the new functions, the inverse, if I give it B, it's going to return A. Here, let's check one. For example, we checked with the original function, if I give it 75, it returns 140. That means for the inverse, if I give it 140, it should return 75. Let's check if that's true. If I put 140 into the inverse one now, it should return 75. Well, 140 divided by 4 is 35, and 35 plus 40 is 75, so it does the job. That's exactly what it should do as an inverse, because it flips the roles of the inputs and the outputs. So here's an example of a question they'll ask you about interpreting. For our cricket and temperature example, interpret each of these if the original function worked where I gave it the temperature and returned the chirp rate. So if this is the original, then this has to be a temperature and this has to be a chirp rate. So I would say at 45 degrees, chirp rate is 20 chirps per minute. You can go and check for yourself. If you go back to the original, put 45 in here. 45 minus 40 is 5, and 5 times 4 is the 20.
Now this is for the inverse. The inverse, this 80 no longer represents a temperature. This is a chirp rate and it returns for me a temperature at which that chirp rate would occur. So we'd be saying here, uh, if 80 chirps per minute, chirps per minute, temp is 60 degrees. You can check for yourself by going to the inverse. If I put 80 in here, 80 divided by 4 is 20, and 20 plus 40 is 60. It does exactly what we thought it would. That's all an inverse does. It flips the roles of the inputs and the outputs. Here's an example of a question that might be asked if we're given it from a table. So if the data is given to you in the form of a table. So the first question to ask me is, what is g of 3? Well, this 3 is an x value. So this is your values right here up top in this first row are x's. These values down below are your outputs, which for the original would be, so these are your x's, these are your y's for your original function. That means when I give it an x value of 3, it's asking what is the y value. Well, I go and look. When the x value is 3, my y value is 7. This is asking when, for the original, when I give it an x value of 0, what is my y value? When my x is 0, my y value is 8. Now it's asking about my inverses over here. So for my inverses, though, these right here are really... Uh, this is now a y value. For the inverse, it gives me a y, and I'm, it's asking what the x value was that would have made that y. So it's looking backward. So now I'm looking not up here to start. I'm looking down here. I need to look at my y's to start. So for my inverse, when I give it 7, it needs to return for me the x value, which is a 3. If it's asking for the output when my input is 3 for the inverse, again, I'm looking down below. I'm looking at my y values and asking what the x value must have been. When my y is 3, my x value is 5. That's how you do it from a table. Last way they might ask this of you is I might ask this uh, of you from a graph. So, again, do slight blue. For the original, the inputs are x's and the outputs are y coordinates. So this is saying when my x coordinate is 0, what is my y coordinate? Well, there's only two points here. Let's mark what they are. So here's this one. This is the point 0, A. This is the point B, 0. This is saying now when my x coordinate is 0, what is my y coordinate? Well, when my x coordinate is 0, my y coordinate is a. So I'd say a here. This again is for the original. So this is an x coordinate, this is a y coordinate. This is saying for the original, when the y coordinate is 0, what is your x coordinate? Well, when your y coordinate is 0, your x coordinate is b. So this would be b right here. Now for the inverse. For the inverse, your inverse takes the original outputs as your inputs. So these are y coordinates. When your y coordinate is unknown and your x coordinate is 0, what is your y coordinate? Well, when your x coordinate is 0, your y coordinate is a. This is saying for your inverse, so your inverse's inputs are y's and your outputs are x's. This is saying when your y coordinate is 0, what is your x coordinate? This would be b. That's how you answer those types of questions. I'm going to ask you to interpret one like we did with the cricket chirp and temperature. So the way that this function works is if you give it a person's weight as the input, it's going to output for you the number of milligrams of a drug that a do doctor should supply based on their weight. Under this context, can you interpret what an original function statement would mean and what an inverse statement would mean? So on your whiteboard, pull it out. These, these should just, you should just be writing down two sentences. This is a verbal description. There's no mathematical computation to be done. Maybe pause the video for a minute, give everyone a chance to try, check with a neighbor, and then unpause it after a minute and you've had a chance to try. Okay, so here we go. How does the original function work? The original function takes weight as the input and returns milligrams for the output. So you would say,
400 milligrams should be prescribed for a patient weighing 150 pounds. Or you could say if a patient weighed 150 pounds, they should be prescribed 400 milligrams. The order in which you write these doesn't matter, but the 400 needs to be milligrams and the 150 needs to be weight. For the inverse, the roles have now changed. This is no longer a weight. This is the milligrams and this is the weight. So you would say a 100 pound person should be prescribed 200 milligrams. Or you could say 200 milligrams should be prescribed for a 100 pound person. Now we're going to do some computation. So we've kind of practiced interpreting it. Now if they give you a function, you should be able to find its inverse. So example, if f of x equals 3x plus 4, find the inverse. Well, how do we do that? Well, f of x, this is really standing for y. So this is y is equal to 3x plus 4. So step one, I would say, is to uh, rewrite as y equals. Step two is we need to solve for x. We need x to be solved for so that now I will give it a y coordinate, it will return an x, because right now I give it an x coordinate, it returns a y. I want the opposite. So if I'm going to solve for x, I'd subtract 4 to start, and then I divide everything by 3. Divide by 3, divide by 3, divide by 3. I end up with 1 third y minus 4 thirds equals x. Last thing we do is we rename using function notation, using f inverse of x. So the last thing we do is we rename it. We would say f's inverse, and in parentheses we put an x. This x represents input. I realize that it's actually a y coordinate, but in mathematics we use x to represent input. So we'd say f's inverse is one third of the input, so we would put x here, minus four thirds. You should realize this equation and this equation are the exact same. The only difference is we use the variable x here to represent input. So x represents input in mathematics. I recognize for an inverse, this x is actually representing a y coordinate, but it could be an application question where it could be about weights of people or the drug prescription or the temperature or the cricket trip rate. So we use x to represent any of those. So this right here would be the final function uh, notation answer. So your final answer is this guy. If you left it right here, I would say you're one step short. You need to rename it using function notation. Now we can check. Here's how we can check. The original function was equal to 3x plus 4. Here's how I would like to check it. If I give it an uh, x coordinate for the original, so let's say I ask it, what is f of 1? If I put 1 in here, I get 3 times 1 plus 4 is equal to 7. So I know that f of 1 equals 7, which means if I put 7 into the inverse, I should get 1 as the output. Well, let's try. I get 1 third times 7 minus 4 thirds. 1 third times 7 is 7 thirds minus 4 thirds is 3 thirds which is 1. So I see then for the inverse, when I give it a value of 7, it returns 1 for me. And that's how I know that I did it right. So the function's inverse is shown right here in red, and we just checked it. So step 1 for this process is rewrite as y equals. Step 2 is solve for x. And the last thing is to rename using function notation. Last thing uh, to note, though, is we found that if f of x equals 3x plus 4, the inverse is not simply uh, 1 over the original function. The inverse does not mean reciprocal. It just means to resolve so that you have uh, x by itself. If we have 1 third minus 4 thirds. That's the same exact thing as x minus 4 over 3. So it does not imply the reciprocal function. On the last page, we found that 3x plus 4 and the inverse was equal to x minus 4. 4 over 3, that's the same thing as 1 third x minus 4 thirds. Same thing, or x divided by 3 minus 4 thirds, it's the same thing. Now find the following. Find what f, if I give f inverse as the input, is going to equal. So 
This means I'm going to input into the original function the inverse. Well, the inverse was x minus 4 divided by 3. So I'm going to take x minus 4 divided by 3, and I'm going to substitute it right in there for x in the original function. Well, when I do that, I end up with 3 times x minus 4 divided by 3 plus 4. This whole statement got put in there for x. Well, this 3 and this 3 are going to cancel each other out, so I get x minus 4 plus 4, and minus 4 plus 4 gives me x. So I get x back, which makes sense, because inverses undo one another. If I supply x to the inverse and then do the original function on it, I'm back to where I started. The same thing works for numbers. If I start with a number like 12 and add 3 and then subtract 3, I'm back to where I started. The same thing happens for functions. If I give it x to start, if I put the inverse into the original, I have to get x in return. It works the other way, too. I could put the original into the inverse. So here, I would be asking, if I take the inverse and I put in the original statement, which is 3x plus 4, I'm going to take this whole statement right here, and I'm going to substitute it into x in the inverse. That will leave me with 3x plus 4 minus 4 all divided by 3. Well, 3x plus 4 minus 4 plus 4 minus 4 leaves me with 0, so I get 3x over 3 which gives me x. So I see if I put x into the original and then take that statement and put it into the inverse, I get x back in return. They undo one another. And that's exactly what an inverse should do. That's what makes it be an inverse. So inverses undo one another. If two functions are inverses of one another, then if I put the inverse into the original, I get x back. If I put the original into the inverse, I get x back. It works opposite too. If I know this property is true, then two functions are inverses of one another. It's how I test whether two statements are inverses of one another. So example, test whether the following functions are inverses of one another. How do I check? Well, I need to check by putting g into f. If I put g into f and I get x back, I'm halfway there, but then I also need to be able to put f into g and get x back. If both of those are true, then they're inverses of one another. Well, let's check. First one, if I put g into f, what do I get? Well, g's statement is x plus 5 divided by 9. If I take this statement right here, red, I'm going to substitute it in there for x. I then get 5 times x plus 5 divided by 9 minus 9. This 5 and that 9 aren't going to cancel one another. So I end up with, if I distribute here, I get 5x plus 25, because this is 5 over 1 when I multiply, over 9 minus 9. You're going to see that nothing's going to simplify out. I end up with 5 ninths x plus 25 ninths minus 9. This is not going to get me back to x. So this right here is not true, which means these two functions are not going to be inverses of one another. I don't even need to check the other side. So I would say f and g are not inverses of one another. That property does not hold if, if I put g into f, I need to get x back. I'm going to ask you to try one of these. So on the whiteboard, pull your whiteboard out. Your first goal is to find the inverse if f is equal to the square root of x. So if y equals the square root of x, can you find the inverse first? So that's step number one. And then test whether the following are true. If you put the inverse into the original, do you get x back? If you put the original into the inverse, do you get x back? So pause the video now for maybe two minutes. Give people a chance to try it. Check with the neighbor. Unpause it once you've had a chance to try it. Okay, so the first thing you should have found is you should have found the inverse, and the inverse is x squared. Why is that true? If I solve for x, how do I undo a square root? I square both sides. When I square both sides, I end up then with y squared is equal to x. That's the inverse. We rename it using function notation, and when I rename it using function notation, I would say the inverse takes things and it squares them. I know that this input is really a y coordinate, though. But there's the inverse. Now I need to check that each of these are true. If I put the inverse, and the inverse I already found is x squared, into the original statement, what do I get? Well, the original statement was square root. So if I take the square root of x squared, what do I get in return? I get x. 
So the first one holds, so this is good. Now I need to check if I put the original into the inverse, what happens? Well, the inverse, I'd be putting the square root of x. That's the original statement is the square root of x, and I need to put that into the inverse. So I take this square root right here, and I put it into the inverse statement. So I'd be taking the square root then of x and squaring it. Square root squared, they undo one another because square root is one half power and one half times two is one. So square root and squared will undo one another. I get x in return. So I get x in return when I input x for both statements, meaning both of these true, they undo one another. So that is the inverse. And that is it for the first day of 2.7. As you're working on your homework, answers will be right here. Uh, you can check as you work and then have any questions ready for me when I return. Otherwise, thank you very much and have a good day.